What actually affects your chances of implantation happening? In this video, you're gonna find out. Hi, my name is Susan and this is The Awesomes. Thank you so much for joining me today. So in this video, I am going to break down the four things that actually affect implantation, um, whether you have a successful implantation or an implantation failure. These are the four things the four factors that actually have an impact. So sometimes implantation problems can be directly related to fertility problems, things like um, endometriosis, fibroids, um, autoimmune disorders. But in this video, I'm not going to be talking about any of those sort of issues that you already know that you might have. I'm gonna be talking about what if you don't have any of those specific fertility problems, but you are still having problems with implantation. Let's talk first quickly about what implantation actually is. When a sperm and an egg unite the fertilization process, this now becomes an embryo. So this happens in the fallopian tube, just outside of the ovary. So it's in the fallopian tube, and then this embryo is, um, the cells of the embryo are dividing and dividing as they make their way down the fallopian tube into the uterus. This process takes about five days, so from the stage of fertilization until the, the now blastocyst has reached the uterus, that whole process has been about five days long. So now when this blastocyst is in the uterus, it actually starts communicating with the uterine lining. Um, so it, sec it secretes, the blastocyst secretes protein molecule molecules. Sorry, there's gonna be a bunch of complicated words in here that I might stumble over. So if I pronounce anything wrong, just bear with me. Um, so the blastocyst is excreting protein molecules and this is how it is communicating with the endometrium, which is also known as the uterine lining. So this communication process um, through these protein mole molecules is letting the uterine lining know if this embryo, this blastocyst is, um, is good enough basically. And when I mean good enough, I basically mean that, well, there's a whole process that has already happened, but basically that the sperm and the egg were both normal cells that had the correct amount of chromosomes in them. And then also after that fertilization process, that when this embryo was dividing and dividing, that the division has happened in sort of a normal, healthy way. So now this blastocyst, um, yeah, basically is communicating with the endometrium to let it know if it is a good choice to be to be implanted or if it ha if something has gone wrong in that whole process that has already happened and that maybe this um, this blastocyst should not be implanted, the pregnancy should not continue. So during this process where this communication is happening, so we need one, we need two things to be happening. So the first thing I've already talked about, we basically need the blastocyst to be a good one, a good one that the uterine lining is going to want to receive. Um, but we also need the uterine lining, the endometrium to be receptive. And there is only a short period of time where the uterine lining actually is receptive, or there could be other factors that are making it, let's say, not receptive. So we'll get into that later. But those are two big things that we need at this point when it comes to the blastocyst implanting. We need a healthy blastocyst and we need an uh, endometrium that is receptive to that blastocyst. So there is this communication that is going on and yeah, this is what we need, good communication. So implantation in itself is this blastocyst um, implanting into the endometrium. Um, so it's kind of like you could think of it as planting a seed. So this, and this blastocyst that is now implanted that is going to develop into a baby. So as we know, some embryos, some blastocysts uh, fail to implant into the uterine lining and some are successful. So what are the four factors that actually contribute to whether this is going to be successful or not? So the four main factors are the embryo is the first one and the embryo can also be broken down further into the health of the sperm and the health of the egg. 
Um, so number one is the, embry is the embryo. Number two is the endometrium, which we've already talked about the uterine lining. Number three would be the uterus itself. And number four would be the health of the mother, the health and the lifestyle choices of the mother. So now I'm gonna break all of these down and give you some actual specific details about what's going on here. And as I break each of these down, you're gonna get a lot of clues and ideas as to what you can do to help um, improve all each of these factors, whichever one might apply to you that you feel might apply to you. Um, but I am gonna make a separate video completely about things that you can do to help increase your odds of of implantation working out for you. Um, but yeah, stay tuned to this video because breaking each of these down is gonna give you a ton of little tips and tricks and do's and don'ts um, when it comes to implantation. So number one is the embryo. Um, as I said, the embryo can be broken down into healthy sperm and healthy eggs because we need each of those in order to combine. Um, we need each of those to have the right amount of chromosomes and that's basically it. We just need them to be have a good DNA, healthy, normal DNA. That's all we need. Um, if you're interested in learning more about how to support sperm, sperm health, uh, I will be making more videos on that. It should be the week after this video that I'll be posting those ones. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about healthy eggs, I do already have a video out on that topic as well. So please subscribe to my channel because um, I have tons of tips and tricks for you guys. So we're not going to get into separating the sperm and the egg right now. We're just going to talk about the actual embryo that has already been um, combined, it has already been fertilized. So we have the sperm and an egg have already been fertilized. This is the embryo. And let's pretend, let's say that this embryo already is, is perfectly normal. The DNA of this embryo is already perfectly normal. So it has the correct now, uh, it has the correct amount of chromosomes. So that is 46 chromosomes, which contains about 25,000 genes. So during the whole dividing process, as the single cell is dividing and dividing and dividing, um, it's really, we really need the division process to be uh, a normal process as well. So these 25,000 genes have to function properly in order for this embryo to develop properly. So you can think of it like a symphony. So genes are being turned off and on um, and the timing of this has to be pretty precise. So if you think of it like a symphony or an orchestra, if the timing is off, then things will go really badly. So when things are going badly, when things go badly during this division process or um, just these, these genes turning on and off, this is called gene malfunction. And this is kind of the, um, the reason why they think good embryos, so embryos that have the correct number of cro chromosomes, why they sort of turn bad. So that process is happening um, even if we have a perfectly normal uh, fertilized egg, perfectly normal embryo, meaning that it has all of the chromosomes, all of the 46 chromosomes. Um, so most of us have 46 chromosomes but most of our embryos actually do not have 46 chromosomes. So a lot of the eggs that are fertilized, basically is what I'm saying, are actually don't have enough chromosomes. Um, so this happens either because the sperm has an incorrect amount of chromosomes or the egg has an incorrect amount of chromosomes or when the two connect, when fertilization happens, there's sort of an error or miscalculation that happens and um, and you result, result with an abnormal amount of chromosomes. And so because of this, and also because of what I was mentioning, mentioning earlier, the division process or the genes turning on and off, um, because of all of these different factors that are happening at this time, um, actually only about one third of eggs that are fertilized will actually implant into the uterus. And after, after that implantation, actually about 15% of those embryos um, don't make it past the first trimester. So uh, basically having an early miscarriage. And a lot of the time early miscarriage, it has nothing to do with what the woman is doing and it is basically just the embryo is not quite 
able to develop. There's just some sort of something going on either with the chromosomes or the cell division or something like that, that the embryo is just not developing properly. So as I was mentioning before, this blastocyst, when it gets goes into the uterus, it begins communicating with the uterine lining, with the endometrium. So this, in a way, is the uterus performing a sort of quality control over the embryos that are coming in to try to attach to the uterine lining. So the blastocyst is sending out this signal to the uterine lining, and it's basically telling the uterine li lining to prepare for implantation. But when the uterine lining receives that signal, it's also getting information about the embryo itself, and from that information that it's receiving about, let's say, the health of the embryo, it is basically deciding if it actually wants this embryo to implant or not. So a healthy embryo will send out, let's, let's call it a healthy signal. Um, so these chemicals, chemical sort of protein chemical messengers to the uterus. If the embryo is healthy, it should be sending out a healthy signal to the uterine lining. Um, if the embryo is incapable of sending out a signal, or let's just say the signal is so quiet, even though it's not a sound, let's just say the signal is so quiet because the embryo doesn't have the strength or the capacity or whatever it is to send out that signal, then obviously the uterine lining is not going to receive the signal and therefore the uterine lining will not prepare itself for implantation, so implantation will not be possible. Or let's say the embryo has like significant uh, genetic abnormalities and so it sends out a signal that is very altered. So the uterus will receive this, the uterine lining, the uterine lining will receive this signal but it will sense that it's like an altered, not, not proper signal, basically. Um, and it'll cause a stress response in the womb instead of the womb preparing for, uh, impairing, preparing for implantation. It will instead have this sort of stress response and make implantation very unlikely. So this is the quality control. This is sort of a test that the embryo needs to pass in order for it to be implanted. But... Um, this is where number two is going to come into play. Well, there are a lot of things with number two. So our number two factor to healthy implantation is the endometrium, the uterine lining. Um, we're still talking about the first one, but I will get into the endometrium right away. So sometimes the endometrium will make this test. So if we're giving the embryo a test that it needs to pass in order to be, um, to be implanted, sometimes the endometrium will make this test too easy or too difficult. So if the test is too difficult, um, then, then healthy embryos won't be able to attach. Or if the test is too easy, then abnormal embryos will attach and results in an embryo implanting that has these abnormalities. So not only is the embryo very important in this process, but the endometrium is also very important in this process. The endometrium has to be working at its best capacity um, in order to set the right sort of standard for to allow healthy embryos to attach and to make sure that abnormal embryos do not attach. So this leads us now to factor number two of implantation, which is your endometrium. So we've already talked a lot about this whole communication process between the embryo and the endometrium, so I don't think I need to get into that anymore, but there still is a lot more going on with your endometrium and, um, and being able to implant properly. So one thing you may not have heard about when it comes to your endometrium is that the endometrium is only receptive to implantation occurring at a very specific time frame. So the period in which the uterus, the uterine lining, is able to receive an embry embryo is called the window of implantation. So this receptivity period of your uterine lining is between cycle day 20 to cycle day 24. Another way to look at it is seven to 11 days after the LH surge that triggers ovulation. So if you are using LH testing strips, this would be a perfect way to, uh, to calculate that. So obviously, depending on the length of your follicular phase, the part of your cycle that happens before ovulation, um, this is really, the follicular phase is really gonna affect whether 
your receptivity period is actually on between days 20 to 24. Ignore all of that and just think of it as seven to 11 days after your LH surge, because that is gonna be a lot more accurate for a lot more people. But please keep in mind that even those dates, um, so 7, 11, 7 to 11 days after the LH surge, even those can be different for different women. So some, for some women, the uterine lining may take a bit longer to mature. And so in that case, those days would be pushed back a little bit more. So yeah, just with everything, it's so hard to tell just by saying this is exactly how many days because we all know all of our cycles are completely different. All of our bodies are completely different. But um, the main thing is to be aware that there is a window of receptivity and it is a short period of time. Like that's only four days of um, that your uterus is actually receptive to an embryo implanting into it. Uh, so this is just one of those other little things that can be having, a, having an effect on whether your, your fertilized egg is actually going to implant. And this is something that you don't really have any control over. So basically, if your embryo is making it to your uterus um, either too late or maybe too early for the receptivity period, um, for the window of implantation, then this could result in the embryo not implanting. So as I said, there's not very much that you can do to affect this, um, but of course there kind of is. Uh, if you can support your hormo hormonal balance to the best of your ability, um, then there's a greater chance that all of these different processes, because as you can start to see, there are so many factors going into just getting pregnant. Um, and all of these have to do with hormonal balance. So your hormones are basic, basically um, messengers. Your hormones are messengers. So they're sending out signals to to, for things to happen basically. So you really need a hormonal balance. So another big part of the whole endometrium's process of implantation is that just what I've been saying is hormonal balance. Um, so the proper signals of hormones happening in order to build up the endometrium lining. So when it comes to your endometrium specifically and your hormones, there really has to be a good balance of estrogen and progesterone. So these two hormones are going up and down um, every single cycle. And if you can get the correct hormonal balance, which sometimes just happens, sometimes it has, it's been affected by stress levels, diet, lifestyle factors, all of these things, um, pollutants, all can throw your hormones off. Uh, but what happens during, during the process of your developing your endometrium is basically that when you get, um, sort of your spike in progesterone, it's not really a spike, but your progesterone increases um, after your egg is ovulated. So that follicle that has released the egg becomes a corpus luteum and this corpus luteum releases progesterone. So as you're getting this increase of progesterone in your body, this is really important, uh, an important time for your endometrium. This increase in progesterone is basically creating this scenario where now your uterus is ready to accept an embryo. So you could basically say that uh, the increase of progesterone is creating this whole um, period of uterine receptivity. So this window of implantation, um, it, it's all depending on the hormone progesterone and the increase of this progesterone in your body. Another important part of your endometrium of the uterine lining is the thickness of it. So um, throughout, again, this all comes down to hormones. So the different hormones that are at play throughout your cycle are also building up your uterine lining. So really hormonal balance is extremely important for all parts of this process. If your uterine lining is not thick enough, then this can have a huge factor in implantation. So there's a better chance of implantation not being successful. So now we're on to factor number three when it comes to healthy implantation. What affects healthy implantation? So we found out your embryo affects implant implantation, your endometrium affects implantation, and now we're gonna talk about your actual uterus. So not the uterine lining, but your actual uterus. So you may have heard the term a non-receptive uterus. 
Um, so basically, I guess that's just kind of a nice way of saying that um, eggs, embryos are not gonna implant in the uterus that you have. Um, so what are different factors that could be contributing to this non-receptive uterus? Uh, things like scar tissue, fibroids, um, inflammation is a big one. Infections that are causing inflammation, all of these different things can have a big impact on your uterus and, and if an embryo is gonna implant or not. So moving on to the fourth factor of implantation, and that is the overall health or lifestyle of the mother. So I always talk about hormones and all of these things that I'm going to sort of list now that have to do with health or lifestyle, um, it all basically has to do with supporting your hormones. Hormones are really like a huge part of your life and everything that you do in your life seems to have an effect on your hormones. Um, so just in general, a healthy lifestyle is going to help out your hormones. And if you can help out your hormones, then that is going to really help out this whole reproduction process. So really, if you want to dig down to the root of everything when it comes to what can you do, um, cause there are a lot of factors when it comes to getting pregnant that there's nothing you can do about it. Um, but if you wanna know like, what can you actually do, just get to the root of it. It's all about having a healthy lifestyle and then maintaining that healthy lifestyle for at least three months while that follicle is going to develop. But honestly, probably longer than three months because what we wanna do first, before we even start developing a healthy follicle, which um, that process in itself takes about three months to do, before we even wanna start developing that healthy follicle, we want to get our hormones balanced, which can take years, to be honest, depending on your situation right now. It can take a very long time to get our hormonal balance back on track. But I don't want that to sort of discourage you at all. Um, I want instead to inspire you to just be able to take small changes and know that each small change that you're taking in your lifestyle to be your more optimal self, to uh, be your optimal health, um, that those small changes are going to have an effect on your chances of getting pregnant as well. And I also want you to know, um, basically whatever point you are at right now, if you're at the point where you feel like you want something that you can focus on in order to, to know that you're doing this thing to help out your fertility. Yes, you can do things. You can support your health in order to support your fertility. But if you're at a place right now where you just feel like you don't want everything to be your fault and, it's, and you feel so guilty of, um, of maybe not being healthy, you feel so incredibly guilty and like so much pressure on you to be healthy again, I don't want you to be in that mindset either because really there are so many things going on during this process of trying to conceive, um, releasing an egg, you know, ovulation, this embryo dividing and all of this other things, all of these processes that it takes just to get pregnant. So much of it is really out of your control as well. And a big factor of it is your, your husband or your partner, whoever's providing the sperm, for them to, to be working on their health as well, for them to have the optimal sperm in order to fertilize the egg as well. So there is a ton that is out of your control, but there is also a ton that you can do. So whatever place that you are at right now, just focus on that. It's not all your fault, but I do want you to feel empowered that you can take charge of your health and your fertility if you choose to at this point. And I also need to say that creating a healthier lifestyle is not about beating yourself up. It's about taking care of yourself. It's about loving yourself, knowing that you deserve the best, knowing that you deserve to have the best health in order for you to have the best life because you deserve it. Not because somebody else is telling you, you need to eat properly, you need to exercise, you need to do this and this and this, otherwise you're not good enough. That's not what this is about. This is about um, finding love for yourself and wanting to wanting to take care of yourself. So 
The first one that I'm talking about when it comes to um, lifestyle and health of the woman who is trying to get pregnant is stress. Stress is a huge factor, a huge, huge factor when it comes to your hormonal balance. I don't care what anybody else says about stress not being a big deal, it really is. If you are chronically stressed out, um, then your body's gonna prioritize those stress hormones and over any other non-bodily, non, non-essential non bodily functions. Um, so your body prioritizes your stress hormones over your reproductive hormones. So if you're stressed out, this is one of those things where you have to start believing that you are worth it, that you and your mental health is more worth more than, than anything else. Your mental health is worth more than how much money you make. Your mental health is worth more than any arguments that you're going to get into. So stress does have a huge effect and I want to encourage you to reduce your stress wherever you can. And I'm not saying you have to meditate, you have to exercise to reduce your stress. You have to do this and this and this in order to reduce stress. All I'm saying is I want you to prioritize yourself. I want you to find that care that you are giving to everybody else and put it back into yourself and know that you deserve to feel relaxed. You deserve to not be stressed out. And then we have exercise. So exercise is another one. I don't want to pressure you and feel and make you feel like, you know what, you're lazy, you have to do more exercise, and because you're not exercising, that's why you're not getting pregnant. No, that's not what this is about. And if that's how you feel, then relax. Don't exercise. Do what is going to make you feel good. The whole idea of this is once you feel like you can love your body and appreciate your body, then you're going to want to reduce your amount of stress because you have that level of love for yourself. Then you're going to want to maybe exercise because you know that if you do exercise, your body is going to feel good and you are going to feel good. And if you don't know that, then Exercise does make you feel better. It burns off cortisol, which is a stress hormone. So if you're stressed out, um, doing some sort of cardio exercise actually burns off cortisol. So then you won't feel that, you won't feel that stress. Um, also cardio exercise boosts endorphins, um, feel good chemicals inside of your brain so that you actually do get a mood boost. So if you are looking for a reason to exercise, to do cardio exercise, then that's it right there. It will help reduce your stress and it will actually make you feel better. But that is not a ploy for me to make you feel guilty in order to exercise. That is me just implanting those ideas into your head so that when you are ready, if you're not exercising yet, when you are ready, you know that you are doing it for a purpose and you know that it actually is going to make you feel emotionally better. And then we have sleep. So sleep is very important because when you're sleeping, that is when your body is healing itself. Um, and we need to be healed. We need, we need this rest period. We need our bodies to sort of reset and heal where they can. So if you're not sleeping very much, I'm guessing that you are stressed out. I'm guessing that there's a lot going on in your life and you have a lot going on mentally. So all of these things can help. They're all sort of correlated, um, you know, reducing stress, exercising, sleeping. These are all sort of correlated as well as the next one that I'll get into, which is basically just healthy eating. Provide your body with, with the nutrients that it needs, whether you're going to take a multivitamin or whatever else, eat a healthy diet. Um, providing your body with the nutrients that it needs is going to help it to function optimally. It's going to help out your hormones as well. Um, and taking care of yourself, uh, part of taking care of yourself is eating healthy. Um, but it's not, it's not necessarily, it's not depriving yourself of the foods that you love. It's more about gaining the nutrients that you need, that your body needs. Don't go on a diet. Don't do this because you hate yourself. Don't do this because you're angry at yourself for eating things that are unhealthy. Do this with the mindset that you love yourself and you want to take care of this body that has done so much for you. You want to give back to it and you want to give back to yourself. You want to love yourself by just providing yourself with the, the nutrients that it needs. And then of course we come to avoiding things that are going to hurt 
your body. So this is basically smoking, it's very bad for you, um, like drinking excessive alcohol, drugs, things like that, that are just bad for you. It's introducing toxins into your body, it's overstressing your liver, and your liver health is very important for your hormones. Um, so, you know, I understand if you do any of these things, um, a lot of the time it is us doing these things to basically deal with stresses that are in our lives. Um, so I totally understand if you do any of these things, but if you can cut down where you can, then every little step is going to be better for your body and really help with the whole process of getting pregnant. So with all of that said, um, I hope that this information has been helpful to you. Um, I hope that I have inspired you, not discouraged you, and given you a bunch of information on how you can possibly empower yourself to improve implantation, um, though I am going to make a completely separate video on things, a list of things that you can actually do to help out implantation as well. So please stay tuned for that. Um, also the next video that I'm creating is a list of things to avoid um, so that you are not harming this whole process of implantation. Uh, thank you so much for watching and please stay tuned for those other two videos. I appreciate you guys being here so much. So thank you again for being here and subscribe if you haven't already. I'll talk to you again very soon. Bye.